prepping is about the most difficult thing you can do. You find yourself being second-guessed and overseen by just about everybody under the sun. Certainly the public tries to play a role, sometimes constructive. Congress tries to play a role, usually driven by which contractor, which vendor, which constituent likes or doesn't like what you're doing. At the Government Oversight and Reform Committee, we try to specialize in being a continuity of caring. Ed Towns, Chairman Ed Towns and I, hopefully, in almost every case, come with an agenda of supporting the professionalism of the difficult job that you all do. We'll fail, too. The other day we had a, uh, a, a uh, oversight hearing on the V-22, and, and I'm, I'm not thrilled. I don't think we, we accomplished what we really wanted to. We never got into the details of the process of how we ended up with an aircraft that cost dramatically more than originally envisioned. Now, being a pilot, I'm not surprised that there are cost overruns in trying to build an aircraft that does what no other aircraft has done before. We also didn't get into the reasons for shortages of parts, the need for uh, uh, replenishment of engines far above what uh, was originally envisioned. They simply ingest dust and don't last as long as we'd hoped. Instead, we got into the question of should we kill this thing because an expert or two talk about the fact that we might lose troops in combat if, the, if an engine fails as it goes precariously between forward flight and vertical flight. And I suspect the other way around is equally precarious. The fact is, that was a known risk at the time that the aircraft was envisioned. It was to be minimized. There were a lot of characteristics that were looked into to try to prevent it. And a hydraulic failure early on in the development of that, that aircraft led to its near cancellation because, in fact, it did fail in a mode similar to that, and it cost men, uh, Marines, their lives. We also heard, I'm pleased, a three-star general stand up and make it, or actually sit down, and make it very clear that this aircraft could have successfully gotten our people out of Iran in 1979 because it could have flown nonstop for that rescue mission that ended fatally in the desert because it was a two-day trek of a lot of aircraft that were not really suited for that unusual mission. This is not atypical for you. Every one of you has faced a program management challenge in which even though there are known things at the beginning, challenges in the middle, cost overruns that although expected could not have been predicted so that you could literally feed it in, and by the way, changes by every organization, including the United States Congress, in the mission that we hope that your project would accomplish. So I'm here today to say that with the new president, with the new chairman of my committee, we are going to make every effort to fuse what President Obama has said is inherently governmental work and jobs, and the professionalism that you have, but that in fact is somewhat in short supply in the federal system. Now, I'm a proud Republican. I'm pleased to be in a building named for Ronald Reagan. I was pleased to see his statue unveiled at the Capitol, determined by the people of California to replace another legendary figure, but finding that, uh, that Reagan had a special place, place in history, second only to Winifero Serra, who formed the missions long before uh, uh, non-Spaniards were in the state. And yet, I have to say that over the last decade, in an effort to find efficiencies and to reduce headcounts, Republicans have used numeric counts to determine whether or not your efficiency was increasing. Now, I'm pleased to be here, uh, and I will take my, my free notebook since this is a widely attended event. I suggest you all do that with SAP because IT was the promise of how we were going to leverage more and more with less and less. And it still is. And I'm not going to sell that short here today. Information systems, both for your use and quite candidly, if Chairman Towns and I have our way, for the entire public's use, are going to make a difference. Our recent legislation that uh, would mandate an XBRL or 
similar uh, uh, database management externally so that uh, all organizations can enjoy the ability to look almost in the clouds at all kinds of information and so that the public can have more access to information they're entitled to, but today are almost impossible to digest, is a goal of the committee. Another goal of the committee is to rebuild your organizations. And the reason we want to rebuild it is that I think that the best contracts, the best deal for the American people, for the taxpayer, and if we do our job right, the lowest cost for the taxpayer and to the, con this is the contractor himself will be uh, done by professionalizing all the resources that you have at your disposal. And I want to grow on that for just a moment. The work you do is only as good as the specs that are written. Now there's some debate about whether or not specs should be written by government employees or they should be written overseen by government employees. I tend to be in the latter category that often the, the detail and the science necessary to uh, pre-assemble, if you will, the scope of a project is, a, is beyond what we would hire somebody for a 20, 30, or 40 year career to do. The diversity of, of, of talent that needs to be brought together, quite, quite candidly, often does not exist in the government. So all of you as program managers have to be part of the dialogue that tells us how to do that. Do we do it by public-private partnerships? Do we do it by firewalls with existing uh, contractors who may choose to add those divisions? Do we bring in uh, teams of better scientists and find a way to pay and retain them uh, to do this? Do we partner with academia? Although I have opinions, my opinions are not based on the kind of experience that many of you in this room have. So I hope that the committee, on a bipartisan basis, will continue to reach out every opportunity we get, including the inevitable Q&A that's going to come after I end my monologue, so that, so that we can do a better job. The president, who I think was rightfully so, uh, shown to be a little naive in what he said we could accomplish, is now putting together a team to accomplish as much as he can faced with the reality of Washington. I chose to, uh, to talk about Ronald Reagan, and I did so for a reason. Ronald Reagan came out of California, an idealist. He appointed uh, a number of his friends. He was famous for his kitchen cabinet, but he was also, I think, well suited uh, to pick out good, solid people to be in his cabinet, his true cabinet. One of those people was John Harrington, who was the Secretary of, of Energy under uh, Ronald Reagan. John Harrington's a friend of mine. And I bring him up for a reason. He was one of the people set to close an agency. He was sent to close the Department of Energy. Now, John's picture is, actually has a wonderful grin on it if you go to DOE, uh, as all the past cabinet uh, you know, secretaries. What you'll see is you'll see his smiling face as a tribute to the fact that in Washington, you can do some reform, but in fact, if you go there to close an organization, what you usually find is not only is that frivolous to try, impossible to achieve, but perhaps the wrong decision. I think President Obama is well served to say he is not going to close organizations. I think he is also well served to say that there may be organizations that are redundant that need to be combined. There are, uh, there are programs that uh, should be joined after Goldwater Nichols. Certainly, uh, we've done some of that. Uh, Mark, your, your, your speech later will probably talk about how when you started your career 30 plus years ago, uh, it was Army, it was Navy, it was Air Force, and the only time they talked was at a war college late in their career, and they talked about how much Army should have beat Navy and never did. Uh, uh, almost never, not lately. I, you, know, you understand, I represent Camp Pendleton, and I'm an Army guy through and through, third generation Army. It's tough. It's really tough. And with that, I want to take your questions. Uh, I even want to take short speeches that sound like no senator would ever have considered making them. Uh, because because we, we come out to these organizations, all the, the subcommittee ranking members, Chairman, and obviously Chairman Towns and myself, because we do not have the answers, regardless of what you see in, in oversight hearings. 
we have a lot of questions. I have some of my people here today, and I will make sure that if you don't talk to me now, but you want to follow up later, you'll be heard. So with, with that, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity today. Hopefully I've teed up the beginning of your thought that Congress should be your partner, uh, that just, just like an IG is not there just to tell you when you did wrong, they're also there to clear the way of problems that exist that keep you from doing your job. Government reform, oversight reform should be there to help you along the way. Uh, I'd like to know about successes because we have enough failures that we'd like to replace with your successes if we can find them and shed light on them. And with that, the lady in, in green back there, would you please ask the first question so I can shut up? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Eye contact will get you every time. <laughs> okay, I am Chris Turpak from the Environmental Protection Agency, and I wonder what you thought of EPA programs. EPA is a regulator. Well, uh, that's, that's a tough one to start on, because uh, I would have thought that Massachusetts would have let you determine whether or not CO2 actually was, was something that we could eliminate uh, uh, from the ends of smokestacks. Uh, look, EPA has a tough job. I came in uh, at the time that uh, Christy Todd Whitman came in, and it was not a pleasant job for her. Uh, I don't think she remembers it fondly, even though I'm sure she remembers the people there fondly. EPA has a tough job because everything that you regulate is almost is an inevitability that we need some of it. It's created by some of our life and uh, in some cases, you're, you have to set goals that are achievable. In some cases, you have to push hard to get goals that are achievable but expensive. Uh, right now, you have the greatest challenge of your life. Uh, CO2, we can't live without it. We can't not produce it. Every cow is giving it to us and every pasture as we speak, and, and all of us are putting it out. And yet, we've said, you've got to find a way to reduce to some level that science believes we should go back to, uh, that level is lower than it is today, much lower than it has been at various times in our history. And so, you know, for your agency, these are, these are tough times. Hopefully what your agency brings to us is, is some checks and balances on politicians on one extreme and the other. Uh, Jimmy Inhofe, who's a fellow pilot and, and a friend, Senator Inhofe, uh, he says there's no global warming at all and the whole thing is a masquerade. Uh, others say that we've already passed the tipping point and we should, you, you should plan for our extinction. Uh, hopefully you're the honest broker and that's, uh, that's the toughest job there is in Washington. It's also the rarest <laughs> accomplishment in Washington. But uh, thank you and I wish I had better news on EPA. It's, uh, hopefully uh, Waxman Markey will be different by the time it becomes law. Other questions, I won't, I won't force any, I won't out anyone else. Yes, sir. Um, Mike Luzzi with NASA. How much do you anticipate push toward more interagency collaboration? If I have my way, and remember, I'm in the loyal minority uh, with the loyal opposition. If I have my way, I want a lot more. Goldwater Nichols uh, is a military mandate that is only about three quarters implemented, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, I, I was on the Select Intelligence Committee and had the opportunity to look at the fact that we put to, everybody has an agency for intelligence, everybody wants to own their agency, every agency is doing something, and uh, even deconflicting got to be tough because how do you get somebody who has the authority to see what he's deconflicting? Uh, nothing could be harder than that that those multiple organizations working together. In the case of NASA and NOAA, in the case of lots of agencies who have assets that are interoperable, have assets that uh, uh, not only can be tasked to do the same thing, but can be tasked to do them simultaneously, we need to do a lot more. Uh, Vandenberg's not in my district, but it's in my heart. So uh, I've, I've looked at NASA for a long time as an organization who's always looking for a mission that gives them funding and is, also, is always competing for the very funding that other organizations find other solutions for. So if, if anything, NASA's a good example of, of a loser because you had to shoot, you had, no, you, you did. But back in the uh, late 70s, you, your organization had to choose the shuttle 
over, man, over, over other man's space and over deep, deep exploration. It had to scale back an awful lot of the exploration of other planets and, uh, and almost eliminate all of the in-atmosphere work that was being done. Uh, now, not Jim Hansen, but, but most. And uh, it shouldn't have been that way. If we'd taken a, a broader look, it would have been netted together. So should we do more of it? Absolutely. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you just one very quickly that, that happens to be near and dear to my heart. Unmanned aerial vehicles are a complete hodgepodge today. Uh, the uh, uh, FAA is looking at 10 years before they tell us how exactly they can fly in controlled airspace, controlled meaning not restricted. For your organization that, that has a number of those aircraft and uses them for a number of missions, for everyone from people flying human beings into hurricanes to see what they're doing, to uh, monitoring global warming and sea temperatures, all of these, these uh, requirements right now have no central uh, organization to try to figure out how to coordinate them. And there lies the problem. Is it a central organization or is it a coordinating organization? And I think that's where you're going to face the challenge, where I'm facing the challenge. Uh, I'm being a little long-winded, but you know, when I was on the Intelligence Committee and we created the, uh, the DNI after September 11th, uh, it was supposed to be a coordinating agency. If you read the newspapers or you Google afterwards, you'll find out there's quite a fight between the DNI and the, and the CIA over who actually controls operational activities. Uh, and although the DNI says they don't, it's very clear that there's a struggle. That's where Congress, I think, has to relook at these things. Uh, and so the answer, the short answer to your question is we should be doing it. We're not yet doing it. We haven't historically done it. And it's a shame because there's so much that you can provide to other agencies and that could provide joint funding that is greater than you have today. Yes, sir. Tom, one with the Department of Energy. Oh, that, 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 you've seen the picture then. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in your oversight perspective on the implementation of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, particularly as it relates to program management and the potential in impact out your budgets. All right. Uh, <laughs> Look, Chairman Towns and I were on different sides, I think, of the, uh, the tariff vote uh, and the stimulus vote. I voted against both of them for, I think, good reasons. Uh, but now that we have uh, $700 billion worth of uh, stimulus slash recovery, we're on the same side on the failures. As you know, initially, there was no money uh, available or earmarked, if you will, for oversight by the entities receiving the money. <coughs> that was a, a, a strong bipartisan statement when Ed and I came from hearings and said, we've got we've to do it. We, we can't expect new money to do it, but we're going to have to at least authorize states and municipalities to take a portion of their money, no matter what it was earmarked for, and pull that off to do, uh, to do uh, oversight and reporting. The other part of it is there really wasn't a, uh, a central reporting scheme. And last but not least, and, and the part that I'm most embarrassed on behalf of the organization, that, which I guess is, is you all from Congress, is we did not bother to look at the details of what level of reporting. So technically, a $10 billion check written to Arnold uh, is the last, the last reporting we have, is the state got it. And of course, that's absurd. Uh, that a, a state would receive uh, billions of dollars and we wouldn't go any further into where it went and how it was shifted. That's being corrected. Uh, but as you know, once you've issued the check, it's awful hard to go back and get additional proper information. You can get an after action report, you're not going to get the transparency that prevents waste. Uh, so I would say that 700 billion, most of which we will, re we will do gotchas of things that looked wrong, but in most cases, we're going to be powerless to say that they violated the rules because the rules were loose enough that basically most recipients could receive the money, spend the money on something they would otherwise have already spent on, and move their own money somewhere else. Uh, but that's a lesson learned, and I think it's an extremely important one, is the next time any money is sent to any, or any lower governmental entity, 
we've got to try to make sure that we tighten down the movement of that into what they were already going to do. And, and I understand it's not a new problem, but it's one we have to solve, because otherwise we might as well just write, write blank checks and hope for the best from those who receive them, because any organization that has their own money, by definition, can move that money out and our money in. Yes? Sir, Mark Roddy from SAP. Uh, would appreciate your thoughts on the issue of cybersecurity and the threats that are involved with that. And what we perceive, I think all of us, as the, the governments, all branches of the governments, desire to have more information technology services available to the citizens through you know, whether it's applications or whatever it might happen to be. And I guess I could ask back, what do you think about NSA having the lead on that now? <clears throat> I, I, I'm torn because they've got the experience, but they've also got, rightly or wrongly, they've got this, this uh, uh, rep, not a reputation, but there's perception of what they are, and, and I think there's a lot more there that's on the positive side, but often perception is more important than reality, as we, as we all find, and I think that's going to be an issue. Well, and I agree with you. That's uh, one of my greatest concerns, is that we started off as like, and this is just one member uh, who, when we started on it, it was, I was still hearing about it through Hipsy. Uh, cybersecurity turns out to be, the initiative turns out to be a pot of money that mostly goes toward firewalls and purchases and software that you were already all doing. And when it's program managers, how many of you saw, when you saw those funds, as funds that were going to fill some need you already had that wasn't fully funded? Lucky you. Uh, because we certainly saw it. We saw it fitting into everybody's budget, just like the supplementals, you know? What were the supplementals? Well, they were the other half of the ask. Uh, for a number of years. My concern with cybersecurity is not necessarily that NSA has the lead, because I, I think all facts considered they're probably the best. It's that the money is too fungible. Too much of the money goes toward, well, we're going to beef up a particular network today, and not, here's how much money is uniquely designed or uniquely earmarked or, or budgeted to go after the enemies who are proactively attacking us. And here's the plan. And I'm off the committee now because of my current uh, role, but I don't think that plan is any better than it was when I was there. The other part of it is, and this is an extremely important one, if we provide people the tools to protect themselves, probably mostly leveraged with those who in the private sector are already in that business so that we not simply federalize private enterprise, but if we provide those tools and contract and fund the development of those tools, then it's like the old expression of teaching somebody to fish rather than giving them a fish. It doesn't seem like enough of the dollars currently go to either of those, and the vast majority of the dollars go toward, I'm going to buy stuff to, to make us safer. And I appreciate that we've been penetrated. Congress has been penetrated. DOD has been penetrated uh, in the released world, even an aircraft system. Uh, link has been penetrated. Those are really dangerous, but those to me are everyday funds that are about doing our job, and the cyber initiative, which the previous president obviously proposed, missed the boat. It was too much money for what it needed to do uh, if it only did what it needed to do, and the rest of the money should have been uh, on budget for real needs of organizations. And of course, from a standpoint of, of all of you, it's a lot easier for you to deal with, wait a second, here's my program money to do what I'm supposed to do, and over here there's somebody looking at these other initiatives of how do we, how do we clandestinely or appropriately attack those who are attacking us, how do we unve unveil the organizations that are doing it, and how do we empower development to protect, and then whether or not you buy a uh, Barracuda firewall or not, you know, that's, that's a normal procurement once it's available and certified. Uh, I will also mention one thing. I, I do think a lot of the NSA, but how many of you use Windows Vista so far? You know how slow it is? It's the first program ever written with the help of NSA. <laughs> uh, the guy from Microsoft came to me and said, this is NSA certified. And I said, well, we've got to get a higher speed line to NSA after I used it. Uh, so hopefully Windows 7 uh, has shortened that line or increased the bandwidth. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Vivian Beeman. I work with the United States Trustees Program. We oversee bankruptcy and with the Justice Department. I'm curious in, in a bigger scheme of government in light of what's happened this week with the tragedy of the Metro, with so many uh, cooks in the kitchen when it comes to contracting, uh, what can we do in government to reform and make us more flexible and efficient so that when things like that that happen that aren't even terrorist related or necessarily related to our jobs, we can continue to move 
zero because if we couldn't pat each other on the back and, uh, and, and arm wrestle each other, we probably wouldn't get any legislation done. Uh, but for a great many organizations, you're absolutely right. We need to have those contingent plans. I think when you read between the lines, you need to demand as seasoned professionals, people at the, the pinnacle of your careers, you need to demand that you be judged based on process and judgment, not based on whether it succeeded or failed. Uh, the V-22, we never talked, we never looked at, at process. We never looked at the details of was good judgment used at each, each point. What we, instead we did was we looked at, well, it cost too much. Okay, but we define success and failure as whether you arrived on budget, uh, then, you know, paper airplanes are, are predictable and cheap, but they, they don't necessarily meet the mission. And building uh, a less expensive, predictable F-4 certainly uh, is doable today. We know how to fly them, and we have, you know, 40 years or 50 years of, of history. But it's not going to be the one that wins the next war. You've got to make mistakes. You've got to be judged based on judgment, not based on whether or not you make mistakes. I was a CEO for 20 years. Uh, by the way, the way you get to be a CEO for 20 years, you start the company and and you get ahead of your wife in the line. Uh, she was vice president, or as we like to say, nice president for 20 years. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes, but because I was judged based on the overall performance of the company, the banks didn't call the loan just because I had a bad product. I actually even had a product that uh, I had to do a recall on one time because of a, a, an installation error that was occurring in the field that we didn't anticipate that we had to get retrofitted uh, because people were installing it in a way that was potentially unsafe. And we worked with federal agencies and Circuit City and, and everyone else to get it done. But I, I was never judged based on success or failure alone. I was judged based on, did I do the right thing initially? If it didn't work, did I take corrective action? If it didn't work, did I take corrective action appropriately again? And ultimately, if you couldn't make it work, did I do what needed to be done? That should be the guideline that you tell us to judge you on. And if we don't do it, you should remind us again that if you don't want risk taken, then you're going to be buying yesterday's technology. You're going to be doing yesterday's programs. You know, I guarantee that you can, you can build what was already built a lot easier than you can build what we envision for the future and need. And I think cybersecurity is a good example. You know, anybody, Anybody can create yesterday's firewalls, but they're already penetrated. We need people to take the risk to do the best they can do, knowing that they will fail. You will fail in cybersecurity 100% of the time. Not every day, every part, but sooner or later, it will be penetrated. Uh, and I, I don't think that should cause you to say, we don't want to plug as many as we can and be proactive and reduce the amount and then go after those who penetrate us. So, that's my problem is, I can say that here, if you say it and you bubble it up and, and it becomes part of the dialogue, maybe over time you can get members of the House and Senate to realize that cheap hits over what went wrong, although they'll always happen, have to be done in combination with thank you for the mitigation you did, thank you for the process, and thank you for creating the transparency to where the problem wasn't covered up but in fact, we all got to be part of the input. And that sort of goes back to, you know, as I promote XBRL and or similar transparency and demand transparency between us and agencies, but also between agencies and their sister agencies, it's designed to say, you will never, never, never see me allowing anyone that I have control over to simply say, you did it wrong, how dare you, if I can say, yeah, it didn't work well, but that happens. You know, I, I, uh, the other day, and I keep going back to this one hearing because it's, it's the hearing of yesterday. The one of today is Bernanke, so tomorrow I'll be talking about Bernanke, I guess. But, you know, the V-22 would not be FAA certifiable. And, you know, NASA realizes the shuttle is not FAA flight-worthy under a bunch of rules, uh, although its, un, it's, it's unpowered uh, landing is actually pretty good. Well, you know, the DC-3 also the, the most flown aircraft in the history of aviation could not be certified by the FAA. And yet, nobody wanted to talk in terms of this military aircraft isn't, quote, FAA certifiable and may never be. Well, lots of things aren't FAA certifiable. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have a shuttle. It doesn't mean 
that we shouldn't find ways to uh, to do that, and, and that includes uh, a lot of the programs you're working on. You're not working on programs in some cases that are easy. And who's here from GSA today? Anyone? Okay, brave souls in the past. That. <laughs> We want you to be the agency of redundancy, the agency of predictability, the agency of products that you go out and bid and rebid, and if we buy from you, we do buy with a high level of confidence. Now, your problem, of course, is you've got, you've got to get as many there, and you've got to bid them, and you've got to make sure they're good values, and you've got to make sure that they're disseminated to all of us so we can make a no-bid purchase in many cases. You have an incredibly important role. But with rare exceptions, that isn't what government does. The programs that you did uh, down at Huntsville, those programs, none of them, when they started, were doable. They simply were envisionable. And that's got to be part of what government says, is if you're rebuying something simple, then we expect to have very few problems. And when there's a problem, you've got to hold the vendor accountable quickly. But when we're working together with, to try to do what hasn't been done, We've got, to, we've got to accept the fact that good judgment is what we hold you to, not perfect results. And they're going to they're gonna take me in just a minute. One more? One more. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> if I talk less. Any other questions? Yes. You were writing so much, that was worrying me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. And uh, do you think that would be an avenue to take? I think it will. Uh, you know, the partnership, at least on our committee, is, is fairly young. Uh, Ed Towns was not there every day at the last uh, last Congress. He was over at Energy and Commerce. Uh, and so both of us kind of come into this thing. And we inherited, no surprise, we inherited the stimulus. We inherited the, uh, the TARP. We inherited uh, the last parts of, if you will, the, the winding down war in Iraq and the continued escalation of problems in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So between all of those, yeah, I think we're going to get there. Uh, speaking, because Chairman Towns isn't here, uh, Ed and I have sort of made the number one goal transparency. <coughs> Demanding that organizations with us find ways to make allowable uh, information as searchable and as transparent as possible. And for those working in, in contracts, uh, what we're trying to say is, if you, uh, if you want to know about your competitor and you have a right to know, we want to make it easy. And if your competitor has a right to know, we want to make it easy for them. Because we think that's the best way to get uh, the least risk bids. Uh, will we get to everything in the next two years? I don't know. Uh, but those are, those are for better or worse, the, the major priorities. Uh, I will mention, since uh, one of my people here today also handles the post office, uh, as you can imagine, our anticipated revenue for the federal government is down, the anticipated revenue for the post office is down, the anticipated revenue for the patent office is down. One of the other things that has not yet been announced, but that we're going to have to be working on in several committees that I sit on, is we're going to have to be figure out ways to allow organizations to give us a plan to be net positive over the next eight to 10 years, but run deficits because those deficits work, should be predictable, particularly when you have uh, retirements, legacy costs, or uh, revenues that are down today, but that ultimately will be paid later. And I think those are, those are some of the areas we're gonna shed light on. In between, We'll have another 300 hearings, so I'm sure there'll be one on almost everything. Now it really is the last question. Yes, sir. The, um, Unless it's not a good question, then it'll be another <laughs> question. Ted Bajeski, the Aerospace Corporation. Um, federal acquisition capability has been severely degraded over the last decade or so as the government's gotten rid of acquisition people and converted more government people to contractors. And Obama's has said that he wants to convert more contractors back to government people and have more oversight of acquisition. I was wondering your thoughts on that. Uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll do better than I did the first time because I started trying to answer that, but I'm not sure I got to you completely. I agree with President Obama that we need to provide all of the assets to project managers, to the procurement system. I don't necessarily believe that every part, and look, most of you are by definition fiduciaries of the American taxpayer's money. That's the most important thing you do. When you pick up the pen and you approve something, we're, we're judging you based on whether or not you've asked the questions and gotten the answers to spend our money wisely. That's, that's why I'm here today. That's why I, I was very happy to accept this. That's the inherently government function. The President and I agree on that. If the person answering the question the, the organization providing what the fiduciaries need to do their job can't be gotten in government, that's fine. In some, many cases, although inherently governmental to get that answer and not appropriate to get it from your contractor, uh, it still doesn't have to be done by the government. Relationships can be public-private. They can be with universities. They can be with contract scientists. They can be with... Uh, senior retired, and one of the things that Ed, Ed 75, by the way, in case you're wondering why I talk about his understanding of the value of retired people, is that someday he will be retired, uh, and not soon. We, we in the government retired a huge, including you, sir, uh, we retired a huge amount of assets that we can bring back if we, if we make the rules such that they're not being people aren't being penalized to be brought back, but in fact they're being appropriately rewarded, if you will, double dipping with us instead of double dipping with a contractor. All of those are where the president and I agree. Where we differ is I believe that centers of excellence, whenever possible, should be centers of excellence that serve the government, serve your agency, your agency, your agency, our tool for all the agencies and not captured by one agency. And I think that's where the President and I don't necessarily see the same. When I go to one of the big 10, 8, 6 CPA firms and say I need to have an audit for my uh, public offering, I don't want them to be captured. I want them to have the expertise of so many different public offerings and so many different public companies that they bring a skill I can't possibly do in-house. It may be that we end up with more not-for-profits, and this is part of, if you will, if I can use the term vision on myself, part of my vision is that not-for-profits may be the growth industry in serving the government, that not-for-profits can, in fact, hire that talented PhD, the retired person, bring them together, and then contract out as a service organization, perhaps on a GSA schedule, to Everybody who needs their help, which might be 25 or 30 federal agencies, it might be six or seven state agencies. SAIC is in my district uh, and, and very active. Uh, Lockheed Martin uh, has contracts all over California. These are organizations that provide services to the federal government and to state and local governments, but they're for profit. I can see where, if we can't use them as our only source, there is middleware, middle ground between simply having a large federal workforce that, quite frankly, has a harder time saying, no, I think you're mistaken, than uh, organizations which have some autonomy but are carefully scrutinized to make sure that their profit motive doesn't get in the way of our being able to ask and receive candid advice for spec writing and so on. I'm not yet at a point where I have buy-in on that, but that's, that's my vision of saying to President Obama, you're absolutely right. Our fiduciaries need the best resources we can get for them. Let's work on finding ways to get them and to get them reliably and without conflict of interest. I think we can get there. I want to thank you all. I'm sorry that I can't stay longer, but I saw you had a busy schedule with other really talented people. Thank you.